Wallace Weems loves skydiving. He loves it so much he joined the United States Army's Airborne Infantry and became a jump expert for the G.I. Joe team. He also took on a code name based on skydiving equipment. He guessed it. Today we're talking all about the Marlin. Wait, no wait. I mean Ripcord. Let's talk about him. Before we start though, let me say thank you. Whether it's your first time here or you're back for more for watching the channel. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the content we upload just like this each and every week. Let's jump into our video. Wallace grew up in Columbus, Ohio, and from a young age, he knew he loved the sky. In high school, he decided to join the Civil Air Patrol, and from there he developed an affinity for skydiving. But he wanted more. He wanted to go higher. He wanted that feeling of freedom and flying to last longer than the 60 seconds a 13,000 foot jump would take. Once he joined and then graduated the U.S. Army's Airborne School, Wallace became proficient with high altitude, low opening, halo jumps. He took his jump AGL from 13 13,000 to as high as 35,000 feet in the air, requiring oxygen and pressure and a nitrogen flush before he even thought about jumping out of the plane. It was the exact thrill he was seeking for all those years. He also developed an affinity for the right arm of the free world, the Fabrique Nationale FAL, as well as his trusty sidearm, the M1911. In action force, Wallace hails from Manchester, England. It was part of the Red Devils Parachute Regiment before he joined action force. Ripcord first appeared in Larry Hama's 32nd comic book issue of a real American hero through Marvel Comics. In the issue, he showed up at the pit with Lady J and showed Grunt and Scarlet their orders and authorizations, saying that they're replacements. The original team was promoted, and so they'd need to backfill with field operatives, and that's when Ripcord came in. By the next issue, Ripcord is with Blowtorch to see Spirit, who was recovering after the nasty assault on Snake Eye's High Sierra cabin. The two take Spirit off to a local mall where he says he wants to buy some quote unquote herbal medicine. Mm -hmm. They spot one of the Freds with his family and they give chase. On the way out, right in the parking lot of the mall, Fred and his family blew up the vamp. And they're able to give chase in a yellow van belonging to, of all people, Bongo the Balloon Bear. It's a mad chase on the city streets as Fred fires heat-seeking missiles from the trunk and Ripcord climbs out onto the roof. Fred slams on the brakes, but Ripcord was able to grab the hood ornament and hang on off the front bumper. Now safe from Fred's handgun by having the engine block between him and Fred. But it was a very precise tactical maneuver. Ripcord didn't have his kit or loadout gear with him except for a rigging knife which he used to carve right into the radiator. When Ripcord takes the van back to Bongo after all this part is done here, Bongo took off the headpiece and okay here we go, Bongo is a lady. Hey they started a date. In issue 37 Bongo had to make a delivery to the Arbco Circus and so Ripcord decided to help her along with Blowtorch and Gung Ho and in the most ridiculous thing ever in all of these stories some of the balloons escaped from the van, someone pulled the door open so Ripcord actually used a trampoline to jump high up in the air with a cape and capture all the balloons in the cape. Craziness. At the circus though, they're seen by Tomax's Zaymon and the CGs quickly show up to chase the Joes away and they trap Candy and Wally in a house of mirrors. Oh, and Bongo the Clown broke up with Ripcord because he wouldn't tell her his real name. Bongo's real name is Candy, but it gets better than that. In the next issue, Ripcord is with Roadblock Stalker and Gung Ho to head down to Sierra Gordo to rescue Dr. Burkhart. They drop in and link up with a new Joe named Rakondo and his Tucardo Indian friends. Ripcord got upset with Burkhart for and her political leanings, which from his perspective seemed to keep getting her in trouble. Okay, so back stateside, Duke raided a Cobra safe house on Staten Island, and it turns out that the house is owned by Professor Apple, a Crimson Guard scientist in the employee of Cobra. The house is full of documents, topographical maps, and information relating to the Gulf of Mexico. It was this information that the G.I. Joes used to blow up a fault line which quite literally gave rise to Cobra Island. Guess who's related to Professor Apple? You guessed it. His daughter, Candy Apple, aka Bongo the Bear, aka Ripcord's girlfriend. Yep. So she had showed up at the house and the G.I. Joe team took her into custody, questioning her, wondering what she knows about her father and her relationship to the Cobra organization. In issue 39, the team in Sierra Gordo rappelled down a sheer cliff face to infiltrate the Cobra Fortress down there, and they managed to pull Dr. Burkhart out, and they are extracted from that mission by Wild Bill. Candy was put on an army bus, and it turns out that a dreadnought named Buzzer was on the bus too. He murdered the MPs and stole the bus with Candy still on it, and on the way to Springfield, they stole a Love Bandit pickup truck to swap it out for the army bus. There were some shotguns in the truck that they stole that Candy actually used to get away from Buzzer. The truck broke down and as she was working on it, a car with a drunk driver and Billy Kessler showed up to give her a ride into Springfield. In issue 43, Candy and Billy were in a car that ends up at the train tracks with Buzzer, Firefly, and Scrap Iron on scene and with a missile destroying their car, killing Softmaster and Ripcord's girlfriend, Candy. 
By issue 45, Cobra Island was now a thing. Ripcord was in the first attack on the island and was injured, earning him a purple heart. Soon thereafter, he was with Ace in a Sky Striker, flying over the island on a recon mission, but actually ejected from the rear seat, the Rio seat. Hawk actually knew he would, so that his assault team would actually be a rescue team and not an invasion, which may just so happen to net them some additional human and photography in the process. Very smart of him. Ripcord's plan was to look for his girlfriend Candy who had gone missing. Ripcord got the jump on a Cobra officer stationed near the beach and with his big knife to his throat demanded to know the location of Professor Apple. Zartan got the drop on him from an elevated position on a rocky crag nearby and drew his compound bow back. Ripcord firmly in the crosshairs of his starlight scope. Silently, he let the arrow fly, but it went through the Cobra officer and struck Ripcord right in his bicep. As Ripcord crawled to cover behind a rock to apply a field dressing, Zartan drew another arrow, waiting for the kill shot. Then, Ripcord brought out his rifle when they traded shots, and then as it started to rain, Ripcord put a 7.62mm round right through the crossbow and planted it in Zartan's shoulder. And as the rain pelted Ripcord, soaking him, the sound of the rain beating on the scope and the rocks around him, he got a bead, finally, on Zartan, targeting him center mass. But Zartan disappeared in the night, fading away like a chameleon. Ripcord propped up his rifle and helmet so it would be silhouetted against the shine of the moon. As Zartan crept up on it, Ripcord's hand burst through the ground like the start of a zombie movie and grabbed right into Zartan's leg. But Zartan overpowered him, but he doesn't kill him. Instead, he shapeshifts to become Ripcord. Zartan's now Ripcord. And Zartan rose victorious as the rain pummeled the island and lightning crashed above. As far as my Ripcord issues, this one is one of my favorites for sure. The Joe team got to the island to rescue Ripcord just after this. Professor Apple was on the island too and he tells him that Candy was missing from Joe custody because Cobra Commander decided not to tell them. So the Professor launched him off the island as Zartan, mind you, in a fire bat. Storm Shadow actually killed Professor Apple, the only one who'd figured out the Zartan and Ripcord were switched. So then the Joe team picked up the fake Ripcord and took him back to the base, but Spirit knew something was weird because Ripcord's wounds didn't match the holes on his clothes because Zartan had taken the clothes off of Ripcord and swapped them out. In issue 48, Ripcord was with the Dreadnoughts who think that Zartan's acting kind of funny talking about candies and whatnot. Ripcord learned that Candy died when Buzzer took her from the Joes. He also learned where Springfield was located and he also smacked Buzzer upside the head with a pea bucket. Later, Ripcord as Zartan is able to call a pit and tell them of the switch, what happened, as well as to inform them of the location of Springfield, which became a major assault story arc very quickly. So he tried to escape, but a little girl actually pulled a giant 357 magnum on him full of hollow points. So he was taken back and actually put in the brainwave scanner. And so then the Joe assault on Springfield happened, and they're able to rescue the real Ripcord who was being held in that brainwave scanner at the museum. I guess then he went on to leave for a while was this whole ordeal of being taken prisoner and losing his girlfriend was a, a lot to handle. In issue 63, Billy Kessler was taken to the Presidio to talk with Hawk and reunite with Storm Shadow. And he also told them about the car wreck that killed Softmaster and Candy back in Springfield. Ripcord finally had details he wanted about his girlfriend's final days. During Cobra's Civil War, Ripcord was part of the security team tasked with taking the airstrip that was being held by Cobra Commander and his loyal troops. In issue 80, a new rock form formed up near Cobra Island, so Ripcord was part of the team that flew in to stake a claim before Cobra could. But it was super unstable, full of seismic activity and volcanic fissures, so they and Cobra were very hesitant to land on it so soon. Outback was the mission commander and Ripcord was the jump master. They were fired upon as their chutes opened, so Hardball took care of that by blooping them with a 40mm frag from his M32 MGL. They had to hold off the bats until the rolling thunder was dropped in, but that was right when the island sunk back beneath the surface of the Gulf waters and it was all over. Ripcord was also featured in G.I. Joe Special Missions 25, an issue that highlighted Tiger Force in a fight against Darklawn, which had a massive pterodactyl on the cover. It was ridiculous and awesome in its absurdity. He remained with the team until they were officially stood down and decommissioned in 1994 with issue 155. During Devil's Due and Image Non-Canon Time, he fought the Iron Grenadiers in Sierra Muerte. The mission, sanctioned by Duke, resulted in some G.I. Joe injuries and a falling out with Duke. After time, Ripcord was put on active reserve. In IDW's G.I. Joe Origins, he hates being called Ripcord and wants a name like Barrel Roll or Ace. <laughs> he was part of a drug interdiction team that had to drop in over the jungle of an African country called Ajak. He was captured, but then he used his deep insertion school skills 
to go John Rambo on some baddies. A Joe team, including Scarlet Hawk, rescued him and recruited him right there in the jungle next to some UH-60s. Eventually, the Homiverse team was reactivated, and in issue 186, Ripcord haloed into Benzene ahead of Falcon, Zap, and Spirit in Leathernack. He did so to set up a landing strip for them. What's cool is we actually learned that Ripcord's call sign is Angel Hat. In issue 193, the Joes witnessed Grunt and some dignitaries taking hostage in Sierra Gordo. The Joes are talking about Grunt and how he met his girlfriend Lola when Ripcord chimes in with this gem. There was only one girl for me, he said, referring to his deceased girlfriend Candy. In issue 210, Ripcord might be the jump master that greenlights the assault team over the always stand drop zone. And later, Ripcord attended the ceremony to honor their fallen comrade, Snake Eyes, and that was issue 214. Later, Heavy Duty, Ripcord, and Airborne were sent into Shazadar to rescue some UN workers who went missing. But the team also went missing, and so CoverGirl and another team had to go in to rescue them. And through the entire operation, they were supported by a drone controlled by a guy named Joystick all the way back at the pit. In issue 261, after CoverGirl's extraction team linked up with Ripcord and his team, Wild Bill showed up at a C-130 where they drive their Chenoweth right into the back of it as it flew just off the ground. As they lifted off, they shoved the Chenoweth out the back and Joystick planted a hellfire right on the baddies. And in issue 270, it's revealed by Clutch that the Bongo van, the yellow balloon van, had been in storage all these years in the pit and that Ripcord hadn't been able to get rid of it. And he continues to be an active part of the G.I. Joe team to this day. And so let's move over to the action figure world. Ripcord's V1 figure was released in 1984, originally intended to be part of Tiger Force which, from launch, which I guess explains why he was in special missions, but that was changed and he got his classic design that we all know him for. He was also featured in a commercial that year for Battle Stations, where they gave him a much flatter looking helmet than he ultimately came with that, so that must have been, you know, like a, a prototype. He also came in an Action Force action pack, box with a Duke figure, and a claw. Since we're talking international, in the 1980s, companies like Estrella in Brazil and Plasterama in Argentina were acquiring G.I. Joe molds for exclusive releases down in South America. In Brazil, Ripcord had the codename of Fumaca. And Fumaca likes to wear his goggles on his nose instead of over his eyes for some reason. In Argentina, Ripcord's mold was used for a figure called Fuego. Fuego's name is Michael Berger. Perhaps after Greg Berger, who voiced the character in his 18 Sumbo appearances. But while also a jumper and with the same mold, he got a different name. Plus, Drama also released a tan colorway with the Ripcord mold, codenamed Sokirk, and the government name, John Murphy. Again, same mold, similar look. A different name. Eventually, Plasterama went out of business, so Estrella took over their market space, and in the late 1990s, another Argentinian toy company bought up all the old Plasterama stock, and they re-released them under the cops line, and one of these was actually a Ripcord. 2003 was an interesting year. 2003 saw the release of some Spy Troops figures, and one of them was an Airborne figure with two different versions. The figures inside as well as the card outside had the exact same figure standing next to a Tala Viper. One of them had a parachute, one of them didn't. The parachute jumper is called Halo Jumper, and this is our Wallace Weems. The other, changed from the initial release, is actually Sergeant Airborne, file name Franklin Talltree. By 2009, he was back to Ripcord, and that year came with a flurry of different versions, aligning with the movies. And here, he now aligns with Marlon Wayans as part of the Rise of Cobra line. He came with an ROC attack on pit set where he and his friend Duke had to defend the pit from a Neo Viper and his vehicle, which looked like a big drill with a seat on it. Then there's the Delta VI Accelerator suit figure that remind me of Master Chief from Halo. Ironic, I think. Jungle Assault Ripcord was tasked with fighting Jungle Vipers with his rocket launcher in the jungle. And then a funny thing happened in 2009. This is when that Marlon Wayans figure was out. It's also the year a figure got an update named Specialist Altitude. It was an update to the V1 Ripcord, but because of the Wayans figures, they had to call him something else, so they updated Freefall to be Specialist Altitude instead. But it's clearly Ripcord. In 2011, he got a much different look for the G.I. Joe Renegades line. For Samba, as I mentioned, Ripcord was voiced by Greg Berger, and later by Carrie Payton in G.I. Joe Renegades. Also known as King Ezekiel, the Tiger King we thought we'd get. <laughs> but back in Sumbo, there was an episode called 20 Questions where I saw Ripcord watching Spider-Man in the rec room of the pit. He first appeared in the Rise of Cobra mini, and finally getting a speaking role by the fifth episode. 
He flew in a Dragonfly in Jungle Trap and in Spell of the Siren, and he flew in a Sky Striker in Hall Down, The Heavens, as well as Synthoid Conspiracy. In one episode, he was held in a dungeon and money to burn while playing poker and parachuting. He had the most lines of the entire run. Most of the time, he's silent or says like one or two sentences. Like in Arise, Serpentor Arise, when he's guarding Napoleon's tomb from being raided, he says all of, well, zero words. He did say a couple things in Cold Slither, though while golfing and he's a man of leisure and freedom. Proof is in the freedom an extended freefall provides, something that he loves dearly. He's a man of few words, but he's very cool. Speaking of few words, go ahead and leave me a comment down below and we'll continue the conversation there. That's it for this one, my friends. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you can be one of the first to know when I upload videos each and every week just like this. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.